Good morning, everybody. Good early morning. I'm getting this video up much earlier than I usually get morning videos up because in a few hours, we're going to have the start of legal tampering kicks off at 9 a.m. My stream will be going live right around 9 a.m., so keep an eye out for that. And yeah, I just wanted to go ahead and get some final thoughts out in front of that 9 a.m. start time. So we're getting started earlier than usual. And uh, I want to take this video to kind of put together some final last minute thoughts on this incoming free agency period. So we have spent a ton of time getting wrapped up in the micro, like this player, that player, this position, that position. And now that we've done that, and we've also processed all these pre-free agency moves the Seahawks have made, I want to step back and take a look at the holistic strategy the Seattle Seahawks may employ this offseason. So, first of all, when you're talking about the Seahawks and the strategy that they're likely to employ, we have to understand cap space. And there's the number, which Corbin Smith lays out here in this tweet, estimated 53 to 55 million in cap space after the Belor cut of yesterday. He admits that he doesn't know the exact number because we don't know the locket details yet. As far as I know, we still don't. I think that if Lockett really did restructure down to basically half of his original 2024 cap hit, the number of the number might actually be about 58 million. So we're going to need more information about the Lockett restructure, but I think it might actually be around 58 million, which is significant. And on top of that, we know because we've seen it happen in real time over the last several weeks, the Seahawks have done almost everything that they could do within reason to clear cap space, including some things that they didn't have to do. They didn't just get rid of players that weren't good anymore. They didn't just get rid of players that were overpaid. They may have actually gotten rid of a player or two who was still worth most or all of the money they were making, and they just wanted to go in a different direction. It's debatable at least, right? Will Disley depending on how you view him, might have been worth the $10 million, and we still decided to move on. A lot of people think Quandre Diggs is worth the money that he was going to make this year, and we still decided to move on from him. Now, some people would disagree about that. I understand that, but the point is this. With a few exceptions, the Seahawks did almost everything that they could to clear cap space, releasing player after player after player, basically every player that seemed like they were realistically on the table for. So, with that being kept in mind, there seems to be some kind of a plan, right? Because after the Belor release, I would estimate cap space at around, let's say it's 58. I think it's going to be about 57 to 58 million. If you trade down for extra draft picks in the draft, which I do kind of think we're going to do, which increases your rookie draft pool because it's more picks, if you do that, and if you plan to bring in a couple of UDFAs that make the 53-man roster, which we usually do here in Seattle, usually we do find one or two UDFAs that we keep around for the start of the season. And let's say you want to have a lot of money in a buffer for the regular season. You want to have like $6 million for an injury buffer and a trade buffer. Most teams do like two or three. Let's say the Seahawks want to do six and you stretch it out as much as possible. You only need like 20 million for all that, right? You need about 20 million because it would be about 11 or 12 million for the draft picks. It would be about 3 million for the practice squad. And then it would be about 6 million for the buffer. You get to about 20 million. That is all you need outside of free agency, right? Everything else that you didn't spend in that hypothetical 20 million, which is very generous, by the way, that can go to free agency. So in that scenario, you're still looking at 35 to 38 million that you can spend in this period. So the fact that the Seahawks were relatively aggressive in clearing that cap space, not, maybe they could have been a little more aggressive. They could have restructured Geno fully. They only did a partial restructure on Geno. They could have extended Geno. They could have let Gino go a couple months ago, I guess. Um, they could have restructured DK Metcalf. They could have restructured one or two other players as well on this team, like uh, 
I, I guess Michael Dixon or a Jason Myers would have created a little bit more cap space. There are a few more things they could have done, but they did a lot. And some of the things that they did were not things that they needed to do. So they create this cap space and we clearly see they have probably more realistically like 40 million to play with during this free agency period as of right now. What are they going to do with it? And there seem to be two paths. One would be you're swinging for the fences. You do go after Christian Wilkins. You do go after somebody like a uh, Patrick Queen. And you go get the cream of the crop. And you pay ridiculous amounts of money, but you're getting the best free agents out there. And that would get people excited. And then there's the path that I think the Seahawks are, are more likely to take, which is kind of stay in the pocket for now. We have a rookie head coach, rookie OC, rookie DC. Um, I, by the way, I know that AD actually was a DC in the, I think, what was it European Football League or something before, but we're, we're not talking about that. Like, come on. Um, our offensive line coach has never coached in the NFL at all before. So we're, uh, my guess would be we don't go crazy. We spend a lot of our cap space on keeping some of the guys that we want to keep around here, like Leonard Williams. At this point, I would expect us to bring back Jordan Brooks some way, somehow, because we're not bringing back Bobby. Uh, make a decision on our tight ends. Maybe we bring back Fant. Maybe we bring back Colby. Um, kind of keep the guys in. Kind of keep those guys. And then you go out and you get the more reasonably priced guys who are going to help to a much lesser extent, but they're still going to help. Go get Jadavion Clowney. Go get um, Calais Campbell. Go get a Lloyd Cushenberry, maybe. Go get a Justin Simmons, maybe. Guys who are good, guys who are capable, guys who are going to help, but they're not going to put you over the top, and they're also not going to break the bank. They're going to be one-year deals, two-year deals mostly. You're going to be able to move off of them really easily. And you use 2024 kind of as a proof of concept for Mike McDonald and his coaching staff. Can you guys produce success with a pretty good roster? And if you can, next year, maybe we take the next step because we're not going to sop up a lot of our cap space for 2025 because a lot of the deals we're going to give out are shorter term. We are going to give multi-year deals where we need to. Leonard Williams would be multi-year for sure, probably three years. Brooks would be like four years. Um, maybe a guy like uh, Jordan Fuller or Justin Simmons would be two years. But we're going to keep our options open for 2025. And if 2024 goes well with what we give them, then 2025 is kind of the let's go for it year. There is a third scenario here. And I wonder if this is appealing to the Seattle Seahawks. I wonder if... They might be looking at 2024 as a year to take it easy. Of course, they're going to try to win games. They're going to try to win as many games as they can, but they're going to try to mostly do it with their own guys as of right now. They're going to try to draft the best that they can. They're going to keep some of the guys they want to keep, like Leonard Williams, maybe Jordan Brooks, maybe a tight end. And then they're going to sit on their cap space, which at that point would still be very significant. You'd probably be still looking at like 25 to 30 million in space and then just roll it over to 2025. So the uh, I got a PFN article up on screen here now. Uh, NFL teams are allowed to roll over any unused cap space from one season to the next. So understand, when a team doesn't spend money, they get to add that unspent money to their cap space for the next season. So if you go lean one year, you can go fat the next year. And some teams do, I think, employ that as kind of a strategy. Now there is a salary floor. Teams must spend at least 89% of the cap over a four year period. And if any team fails to reach that threshold, they are forced to pay out to the players who are on the roster. So you can't just sit on money and sit under the, deep under the salary cap forever, but you can do it temporarily. You can do it short term. And I can definitely see that strategy appealing to some people. After all, we did decide to take on the whole Jamal Adams dead cap hit now. And we are near the league lead in dead cap for 2024. 
we are right up there with Denver. And Denver obviously has, I think, more way more dead cap than we do at this point because of all the stuff that they've been doing. But we are not far behind. The Adams and Diggs dead money alone is more than most teams' entire dead cap hit this year. So that may be appealing to some people. Just save the money, roll it over, and then 2025, you can go nuts. Now, I would caution against that. For one, there is a extensive history of teams that roll into an offseason with massive cap space. They typically don't spend that money well. They typically don't spend that money efficiently. What happens is that free agents look at that team and say, that team has a lot of cap space. I can ask for anything and they will give it if they want me that bad. They will overpay the crap out of me because they can afford to and they're eventually going to talk themselves into it because they can afford it. Whereas if you have less cap space, a team, is, a player is more willing to realize that there's only so far that I can push. So when you look at teams that go on crazy spending sprees in free agency, rarely does it lead to a lot of wins. In fact, I recently saw a chart, and I, I can't find it, but I recently saw a chart that showed the teams that generate the most wins per free agency dollars spent, and the teams that spent the most were the least efficient, and the teams that spent the least were the most efficient. So there's something intrinsic about having a ton of cap space that leads to you spending inefficiently and ultimately not being able to maximize your dollar. You're better off going in with normal cap space. So I wouldn't necessarily advocate for that. That's how you end up spending $25 million per year on a player who's worth $16 million a year. That's how you end up giving a $20 million a year deal to a guy who's worth $12 million a year. Because you can afford it. It just burns a hole in your pocket. Even Bill Belichick did this. You guys remember a few years ago when Bill Belichick had a ton of cap space in New England and he went out and threw a ton of money at Hunter Henry, he threw a ton of money at, at, at Jonu Smith, he threw a bunch of money at some guys on defense, and it went how you think it would prop. It went how it went. New England hasn't won a playoff game since that free agency splurge. Belichick got fired a couple years later. They're one of the worst teams in the league right now. And, I mean, it's all bad. It's pretty bad. So, those free agency splurges, they just don't ever seem to work. If anything, you're better off just going into free agency with a normal amount of cap space, so that way players can't press you too hard. And you're not tempted to go after the sucker move. You're not tempted to go, oh, here's $100 million for, a, for the eighth best middle linebacker in the league. Oh, here's $80 million for a slightly above average right tackle. You stay away from that stuff if you can't afford it. And I don't believe that the Seahawks front office is going to be the one front office smart enough to avoid that trap and somehow manage to brainwash players into taking normal contracts when they can clearly afford more. So I know the rollover strategy is going to sound appealing because it, it would be really, really fun to... Just re-sign a couple of guys, keep things super cheap this offseason, and then next year have like $100 million in cap space. Which, you could do that. You could definitely generate that scenario. Um, it would require you to probably move off of Geno. It might require you to extend or trade Metcalf. It would probably require you to have Lockett retire at that point. Um, it would require some things. It is doable. But what is on the other side of that rainbow when you have that massive cap space, tends to not be nearly as good as it sounds. So I definitely want to see the Seahawks over the next couple weeks here do one of the previous two strategies. Either swing for the fences, go get Wilkins, go get Queen, go get uh, some uh, Connor Williams, or keep your guys and go after some guys who are going to help you for the next year or two and you can get for reasonable prices on short-term deals. Do something to help the team now. Let 2024 be that proof of concept year. And then we see where we sit after a year. But don't think that free agency splurging is the way to winning. All right. See you guys later. Go Hawks. And uh, see you guys in a few hours.